Hey everybody, Mason Claude here with BW Fusion, technical agronomist for Iowa, Minnesota. Uh, today I just want to make this video quick um, regarding meltdown and humical. So get a lot of questions regarding the application, the importance of those products, when to place them, how to place them. And so I uh, just want to make a few uh, quick overviews of how and when to use both of those products, but especially Humical is what I really wanted to talk about. It's a product that a lot of people may, this might be your first year running it or only second year running it. A lot of questions on rates, timings, that sort of thing. Um, and so I've got kind of a rule of thumb for understanding whether or not it's gonna be worth applying Humical to a field, right? So the reasons why you're gonna apply calcium in general is to manage your magnesium for better potassium availability, that would be one. Another reason would be soil aggregation. The only two elements known to flocculate soil are carbon and calcium. And so um, we can drive better soil porosity if that's a limiting factor. And then also just soluble calcium. Majority of fields in general on most years are gonna be deficient um, or at least less than optimal in soluble calcium levels for that plant. And again, we want soluble calcium, especially early, to set up a very healthy vascular system for that crop to move water and minerals up and sugar down to that rhizosphere, feeding our microbes all over again. So um, how and when to place Humical. Humical is easiest to figure out where to place when you got the Grammy 365 data at the end of the day. It gives me an end all be all, black and white answer, yes, this belongs on this farm. Um, so I'm going to list off a few ways you can understand where to place it using 365 data and then also kind of see field touch method, right? Um, so first reason, again, number one reason why you might use Humical is low soluble calcium levels. Now, you're not going to find that on a standard soil test. You have got to find that on a Grammy 365 test. So that is the only way uh, we're going to know if you are high, medium, low um, for plant available soluble calcium is using 365. Uh, better yet, baseline RX, we can understand where the entire field sits from a soluble calcium standpoint to understand, you know, does that two gallons an acre application of Humical make sense for the entire field or just this one zone over here? And is there a way that we could also manage that differently uh, moving forward for that soluble calcium, right? So um, baseline RX would be the best way or at least in season samples to let me know where are my H3A Haney extractable soluble calcium levels. So um, for those of you that obviously need a number to understand what is sufficient. In my mind, if we're above 900 to 1,000 part per million, when we're in a CEC above about a 15 or 20, and we're above that 900 to 1,000 ppm uh, for soluble calcium, I do not care what pneumonium acetate test say, says, soluble H3A Haney extraction calcium. If it's above a 900 to 1,000, um, then soluble calcium most likely is not completely limiting as far as crop nutrition soluble calcium. So that's, that might be reason one why you might use Humical. Um, the second reason why you might use Humical is um, for better soil aggregation. Like I mentioned, carbon and calcium are the only two elements that are ever gonna aggregate your soil. Aggregation is when your soil finds structure and stability, right? It's the carbon is the glue that holds together your sand cell clay molecules. Your calcium is what changes the actual lattice structure of those particles into a porous, cottage cheesy kind of um you know structure so it gives you stability it gives you better water permeability better rooting all of those attributes so uh, a sea field touch method everybody should not be shocked when i say if your soil is sticky if it is tight if it is compacted if those roots are having a hard time penetrating that top zero to four inch soil profile um areas of you know, dense traffic or maybe no-till situations, or if you ever have a situation, especially no-till, like we have no-till beans or corn, and you struggle um, with shutting that furrow again. Remember, that's that's just because you lack that structure to shut that furrow. And so if you struggle with compaction on a sea field touch, you know, analysis, you can understand if you have compacted soil. It really doesn't take a genius to figure out if it's compacted. Is it flocculated or not? Do you have to have a sledgehammer and chisel away at it during a drought? And if so, it's most likely compacted and calcium is the only thing outside of carbon that's gonna drive flocculation. So um, that's a couple sea field touch methods. Everybody knows what compaction looks like. Um, if it's compacted, soluble calcium does drive flocculation. Now, is it going to be a cure-all silver bullet? You're gonna spray this Humical product, magic fairy dust happens, and all of a sudden you don't struggle with compaction whatsoever on that field, absolutely not, that's unrealistic. But um, in the long term, year after year applying two gallons of Humical is going to drive better structure, better aggregation over time, therefore reducing the impact of compaction. Okay. Um, 
Then, as far as utilizing your Grammy 365 test, which again, is my preferred method, it is the best method, um, is to understand your VAST score, V-A-S-T. Um, VAST, in simple terms, is your soil aggregation. I keep saying aggregation. If you don't know what it is, look it up. Um, <clears throat> aggregation is really important for water permeability, root penetration, all that sort of thing. So, when you look at your Agrami 365 soil test, your VAST score, the goal is for VAST to be the same number as your CEC. And so if you've got a 20 CEC, you want a 20 VAST. And what that means is that you've got optimum soil aggregation. And so um, if you are not at a one-to-one -one ratio, if that, if that VAST score is not the same as your CEC, then you've got room to improve on with your VAST and calcium and carbon are two ways to improve VAST scores. So um, you can use VAST or your Seafield Touch method of you know how tight is that, that zero to four inch solar profile. And before I also mentioned how sticky it was, and so that leads me to the reason number three, why to use Humical is because of stickiness. And it's not just stickiness necessarily, it's magnesium. Um, in most areas of Iowa and Minnesota, we rarely have a potassium problem. We have a magnesium problem. We rarely have low PPM values of potassium across the state because we're all really, really good at over applying nutrition. And so we've usually got really good levels of potassium, but potassium accessibility is God awful. And what that, why I guess is because uh, you've got too much magnesium. Magnesium is what makes your soil sticky. Again, that sticky kind of texture where you can really ribbon out, really long ribbon, um, is because of magnesium content within that kind of clayey, heavy, dense, uh, you know, Des Moines lobe uh, soil type. So um, why you would use Humical um, in the fall would be to displace magnesium. So the reason why calcium is the only thing that can really help aggregate your soil outside of any other nutrient you can apply calcium is the one that aggregates soil outside of carbon is because it displaces magnesium it's the large cation on your cec and so what you as your cec increases most of you have probably noticed this as your cec increases so does your magnesium so does your uh you know calcium your well usually not your potassium because magnesium outcompetes your potassium and so in order to get more access to our high levels of potassium we need to get rid of magnesium. We don't need to add more potassium. Potassium cannot displace or take the place of magnesium because magnesium is a larger ion. The only thing that can displace or take the place of magnesium is calcium, and it has to be soluble calcium. So um, by applying Humical, what we're gonna do is displace that magnesium, put it into a vulnerable, soluble state, and hopefully, uh, as I, my recommendation usually goes through to the next spring where I apply AMS, where I have high levels of sulfate um, in season. That sulfate can bind onto that magnesium, create magnesium sulfate, which is Epsom salt, highly soluble, can lead to a deeper soil profile. And therefore, getting your potassium to magnesium ratio in closer check. And so uh, that brings me back to 365. You want your K to mag on your ammonium acetate test to be about a one-to-one. -one. So if you've got 500 parts per million magnesium, you want 500 parts per million potassium. Now, is that realistic to get it to 500 parts per million? Probably not, not without excessive manure applications. And that's why if we want to manage our potassium better, we need to look at getting rid of magnesium before we apply potassium, if that makes sense. So the only way to do that is with soluble calcium applications. So we can apply that soluble calcium, displace some magnesium, and now we can get maybe 200 ppm potassium for a lot of some people, 150 ppm potassium, we can get closer to that 150. Now, is that to say, don't apply any potassium and just apply this Humical product and we're all gonna rock and roll and it's all gonna be good? No, absolutely not. Because at the end of the day, we, when you're in really high magnesium environments, it's gonna be a challenge that you have to always be managing every single year. Um, now, granted, it's going to bring a lot of efficiencies, whether that is your root penetration, aggregation, or your potassium availability, or all of the above, right? Um, so, overall, those are three ways I analyze whether or not Humical is an appropriate application is, uh, A, your plant available calcium. If there's not enough plant available calcium, we're going to have a crappy vascular system. That's the most important part of setting up your crop. So, poor soluble calcium levels, I'm going to apply Humical. Tight soil, tight, high CEC, high clay content soils. 
it's going to be almost a no-brainer for me almost every time especially if we struggle with that zero to three inch soil compaction especially in like early spring um, even if you're not no-till you know even conventional till everybody knows what it's like when you run that cultivator through how tight that top zero to three zero to four inch profile gets so if that's a typical struggle i'm going to apply humicale um, then the other thing is that if I'm trying to boost potassium efficiency, when I get in those high CEC, high magnesium environments, the first thing I need to do to manage my potassium is manage my magnesium, and then I can manage my potassium. So in those three situations is when I'm going to be using Humacal specifically. Um, I always get the question all the time, well, are there any, is there anything else that I can be doing to help with this process? And there are things that you can be doing to help with the process, but the reason why Humacal was, was built was to give you immediate ROI while increasing the sustainability of your soil chemistry changes, right? So we're changing the chemical, the chemistry of your soil over the long term while getting short term benefits, whether that be from the soluble calcium, more potassium availability, all those different attributes we just talked about. Humacal is 370 times more soluble than gypsum. And so every time that I'm in an environment higher than 15, 17 CEC, especially if I'm above a 20 CEC, I hardly ever recommend gypsum because the response is so low. And if we are gonna use gypsum to try to manage this magnesium issue, use it ahead of beans has probably been the highest um, profitability I've ever seen, but using gypsum ahead of corn, frankly, just has not really been there for me in my experience so far. So anything above that upper teens or low 20 CEC is when I start to pull gypsum applications out, unless we have a very severe issue that's really showing that we need to you know, be managing differently. Um, so that's one question I get all the time. I also get questions on, should I run more my first year, less on the second year? Uh, should I run 10 gallons the first year and then run two gallons the next year and then run a half a gallon the next year? And, you know, trying to come up with all these different rates. And at the end of the day, the two gallon an acre rate was built for a reason. And it's because we can get enough soluble calcium for plant uptake. We can drive that different soil chemistry, which drives the vast score, drives your aggregation. And we can drive better potassium magnesium ratios on two gallons an acre of humicale. So we want to stay at two gallon an acre every year. Really don't want to go too much higher, frankly. Um, I tested out 20 gallons an acre because I'm an idiot and um, was just really kind of curious and did not see uh, that huge, amazing benefit that you might think that you would see uh, from going above and beyond the, the recommended rate. So again, two gallon an acre is what's recommended every year, year one, year two, year 10, uh, two gallon an acre with meltdown is what is recommended. Um, now, again, I said with meltdown, as I mentioned before, meltdown, creates more soluble carbon for everybody that's been paying attention and i hope to god you have been that carbon and calcium are the only two things that can aggregate your soil so if you struck if you struggle with that number two bullet you struggle with aggregation you struggle with structure you struggle with that cottage cheese kind of structure you struggle to shut your no-till bean furrow back in the spring maybe you even struggle to shut your conventional bean furrow or corn furrow back shut every spring it's because of poor aggregation and poor stability. And the only two things in this world that can correct that are soluble calcium and soluble carbon. Meltdown is always going to break down and degrading complex carbons into soluble carbon, therefore providing better aggregation and stability in that soil. That's why they're paired together. That's why I always recommend them together. Um, beyond that, logistically, as hopefully all of you already well know, meltdown is gonna be from degrading that, that fodder, those complex carbons, it's gonna increase plantability, uh, reduce hair pinning, um, be very beneficial in those no-till or strip-till or minimal-till high-speed disc environments. Um, I also want to bring up the high-speed disc a little bit. It's gained a lot of popularity. Um, and what I've noticed over time of using a high-speed disc, I would prefer it in the fall if it is gonna get used. Um, but I have been noticing where these high-speed discs have been used for multiple years. Um, we tend to struggle with compaction. We lose our aggregation, we lose our stability, and we end up with a compaction layer at only about three inches, and we re end up with reduced rooting. And so that's, I, I bring this up because if we can pair meltdown humical to try to mitigate the negative side effects of high-speed disking, high-speed disking is to manage residue, right? That's what we're trying to do. We're doing the same thing with meltdown and humical, but even in used when it's used in conjunction, uh, we can manage residue really well and try to mitigate the negative side effects of using a high-speed disc, which would be that compaction layer at about three inches and reduce stability and aggregation. So 
hopefully uh, this video was very, very helpful to everybody to understand kind of when and where to place Humical especially, uh, but also understand the importance of pairing the two products together. Um, any more technical information, uh, hopefully, you know, reach out to your, your rep or reach out to me as far as, um, you know, timings and placements again on your own specific operation. But in general, those are the kind of ways that I evaluate where to place Humical and where to place Meltdown.